I'm going to introduce Janie Wallach, who's going to introduce Benjamin. And Janie is on the committee and has put this meeting together for us. And we're grateful for that. Thanks, Janie. Hey, everybody. I'm Janie Wallach. And um, the reason, well, one of the reasons that we are meeting here tonight is because I do a lot of live recording and I do a fair amount of live recording in this very room. Um, it sounds great. It's, you'll notice the acoustics are, are, I mean, as live venues go, the acoustics are decent, which is more than can be said for many live venues, uh, as you know. And in addition to the fact that the room sounds decent on its own, the man I'm about to introduce to you truly knows how to make the room sing. Benjamin DeVore, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Janie. My name is Benjamin DeVore. I'm a audio engineer at High Dive here in Fremont, Seattle. And I've been mixing in this room since about 2018 or so. And tonight I'd like to talk to all of you uh, about just some basics that when it comes to mixing live bands at a small or mid-sized venue like this one, just based on the introductions of everybody that I saw, it sounds like most of you will probably already know some or maybe all of what I'm about to say, but some of you that might be a little earlier on in your audio journey or that focus more on studio recording instead of live recording might pick up a thing or two. Later on in this presentation, I'll be showing some tips and tricks specific to the Behringer X32 or Midas M32 console, but most of what I'm going to be talking about is more general than that. This presentation slide won't advance. We're off to a great start here, guys. One second. Okay, there we go. So welcome to the High Dive. We're in the heart of Fremont, Seattle, and uh, we've been here for almost 20 years. High Dive opened up in 2006 as a place called Sweet G, which was more of a jazz club. Uh, it's a little bit before my time here. But the uh, the room has been a music venue this whole time. And it's in, I don't know how much you can see from the video presentation that we're doing, but it's in kind of an oddly shaped room. It's it's like a, a long, narrow brick with a lot of concrete. Uh, and that, that creates certain challenges when mixing audio, as, as we'll see. But um, there's things that you can do to get around things like that. Uh, part of why the room is shaped so strangely is that the building that this is the club is built into was i don't know when exactly it was built sometime in the 20th century but i understand it was originally some sort of warehouse that has since been partitioned into several different shops and restaurants and businesses so it's a little funky but that's the way we like it in fremont why won't this work come on i'm ah, sorry for the difficulty folks I click, it will go. There we go. So the building, uh, the, the club opened as Sweet G in 2006, and it became the High Dive when it changed hands in 2012, and it's been called that ever since. In 2019, in October, uh, Nectar Lounge, which is also right in the center of Fremont, right across the street, acquired the place, and now it's uh, sister venues. It's It's been really great having a secondary venue that, we can share equipment and personnel between, and it just kind of makes everything go a little bit easier. They uh, picked possibly the worst time in history to purchase a new music venue, but we got through it, and it was no thanks in no small part to their support. In case you're not aware, High Dive's been known as a traditional spot for local rock, alternative, and funk acts, and of course, we still represent a lot of that kind of music here, but especially ever since the Nectar acquisition, we've been uh, branching out and we have all kinds of music, including hip hop, DJ, reggae, and uh, we've been doing a lot of cumbia shows in the last year or two, which has been a real treat. I've really been enjoying some of the cumbia bands we've had in here. 
What is cumbia? Cumbia is, uh, oh boy, I'm going to possibly describe it incorrectly, but it's a traditional form of, of a lot of Central American and South American music. And I actually think the best way to describe cumbia is uh, a slogan that I saw on the sweatshirt of a band that was playing here. I think it was Son Rompe Pera that uh, they had like a big hoodie that just said cumbia is the new punk. And I couldn't agree more. Look it up if you're unfamiliar. Check it out. There's some really great stuff going on. So at High Dive, as uh, Janie alluded to, we have a pretty wonderful sound system for how small of a room this is. And uh, most of it has been original since the place was first opened in 2006. So just briefly, we're just going to go through all the tech specs of the equipment you see here. And then later on, we'll talk more about uh, some things having to do with using them. Our main speakers, which have been here since we originally opened, are two Macaulay AC422-2s. Um, I don't know if this is on camera. You can see we have them mounted at the corner of stage right where I'm pointing. And these are two-way speakers that we use for our mids and highs. And underneath the stage, this is not original. We just put these in like a year or two ago. Oh, my goodness. Uh, these are subwoofers. And we have three Macaulay AC288 dual 18-inch subwoofers. Uh, you can't see them. They're underneath the stage. And on the front of the proscenium on the stage, we have sort of a, a, a chicken wire mesh kind of thing going on so that the uh, sound can pass through. I'll be getting into more of this kind of issue in a little bit, but putting the subs directly underneath the stage can create a little bit of a situation sometimes when bands, especially more bass heavy bands, uh, we'll hear the bass overrepresented on stage and they'll think like, oh no, the whole room's just drowning in bass, but it's actually just a consequence of standing right on top of them. But one of the things that's really important to do when you're mixing live music is to establish rapport with the bands. And if you tell them things like this or other kind of disarming uh, uh, stories or, or just particulars about the room they're playing in, it usually helps ease their mind a lot, which helps them concentrate more on the music they're about to play. Regarding the subs, um, uh, people not online, people online can't see that, but they're in a slight arc. Mm -hmm. So the center one is is square to the room, and the two outer ones are sideways at about a 30 degree angle or something. Was that a plan for some reason? Well, it's just part of the idea is that if you have a bunch of subwoofer fronts that are all lined up, you can create more noticeable interference patterns if they're slightly offset forward or backwards, especially with lower bass frequencies. So by tilting them a little bit, you know, we all know that with bass speakers, the direction is a little less important than with uh, high frequency waves. It just helps uh, diffuse things a little bit and create more of a more of a complex reflection pattern for the bass uh, so that it's not perhaps canceling each other out right at the source because they're all aligned in the same direction. Similar uh, to, to go on, we have six front stage monitors. These are all passive monitors. They're Radian micro wedges, Apex 1200s. And uh, Dan was talking to me as we were setting up today that uh, Radian was, what, who did you say they were acquired by? Uh, Radian wasn't acquired, but they sold the product to uh, uh, like EAW, EAW or something? EAW, yes. Yeah. yeah, they were designed by Dave Ratt for Radian originally. And uh, they took it to EAW, but apparently it, I, Apex is still a thing. If these are Apex, that's subsequent to the EAW sale, so they must, right. they must be different somehow. Well, these speakers are all passive speakers that are driven by external amps, which we'll come to in just a moment. Right. I've never had the pleasure of taking one of these apart myself, but I've, I'm, I'm to understand that the driver in the middle is uh, one heck of a magnet that, that's like some sort of dual driver setup. It's and, a coax setup. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, 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 one of the, the consequences of that is these monitors, which sometimes you'll have to move around for a band's particular need, are much heavier than they look. So these things are built like tanks, and uh, I think they'll last us many years here. 
We also have a large drum monitor that we've moved off to the side here. This is a JBL dual 15 inch monitor. It's also passive. It's being driven by some amplifiers that are off in a closet in the other room, including the main amplifiers, which uh, as you'll see are listed are just crest amplifiers of, of various model numbers. Uh, we have a, a three-way system overall. That's two-way on the Macaulay main speakers and the lows are going straight to the subwoofers. We are also running a Macaulay digital crossover in the amp rack, and that's just something that's uh, never been something we've had to adjust since its original installation in 2006. I understand that it also has some extra features like limiters just to protect our, our speakers and equipment, but honestly, with our noise restrictions at this location, we should never be getting anywhere close to that limit. So it's a uh, kind of a moot point. What are the noise restrictions? Uh, it's a little bit silly the way that they're actually set out by uh, uh, the people that, that say that we have to keep them. But generally we try to keep the sound level at 110 decibels C weighted as measured from the sound booth, which is about uh, 20 to 30 feet away from the stage, kind of towards the center of the room. In a moment, we'll be taking a tour over there so we can get a closer look at the sound booth. We also have uh, QSC and Crest amplifiers driving the monitors on stage. And um, I didn't list this on the slide, but we have a pair of active monitors for bands that require more, perhaps if they have like a keyboard player standing in the back corner where I am or just wherever they need. And uh, finally, we have a digital mixing console, which is a Midas M32. For those that don't know, Midas and uh, Behringer, which is a brand name that I think most people will be familiar with, acquired Midas when they were in, in danger, I think a couple of years ago, maybe closer to a decade ago now. And one of the really interesting and to me smart decisions that they made was they put out the Midas M32 console at the same time as the Behringer branded X32 console. And these products from a, from a use case point of view are very similar. Uh, the internals are a little bit different in terms of preamps and other sort of electronics that process signal, but the user interface is almost identical, which is awesome because a lot of especially very small clubs or other, other small scale ventures will use a Behringer X32 console due to its low cost. But if they upgrade to a Midas M32 system, for the staff that's already familiar with it, it, it should be just so easy to, to move from one to the other. I myself was more familiar with the X32 when we upgraded to our M32 system. And it was amazing. I, I still had all the same muscle memory for using the same buttons because the physical layout is the same, the user interface is, almost identical um and it's it's just really great to be able to move from one system to the other a little later on i'll be demonstrating some tips and tricks on this x32 uh that i brought that's on stage so even though the high dive uses an m32 system which we'll take a look at in just a moment uh the x32 that i'm demonstrating on should be so similar that that all of the uh, same techniques should be applicable from one to the other in fact, let's take a walk over to the sound booth right now. While I'm walking over there, if anybody on Zoom has any questions, I'm happy to answer them at this point. But I might not be able to hear you. Somebody may need to relay And we'll to show me. this, what he's seeing on the screen here, if you want to get here. It's going to be hard to see over that wall. You got a shot on that? Uh, Gary, okay. put on camera one when he's ready there. And watch your step on the floor here. And uh, where I? that's next door. <laughs> here we are in the sound booth. Uh, if you're hearing a little bit of music, that's actually coming from our one of the next door businesses that I mentioned. That's a Red Star Taco Bar. And uh, typically they run their sound system, but it's not a problem here because, well, this is a rock and roll club and we usually run it pretty loud in here. Uh, however, for a quiet event like this, you may hear it. So I apologize for that if it's distracting. Here we are in the booth. We have our Midas M32 system, and we also have this uh, Onyx lighting controlling uh, software for controlling the lights on stage. 
One of the things that you may find yourself if you're doing sound at a small or mid-sized venue is there might not be a separate lighting designer. You might have to set up the band, mix the band, and also do lighting cues. And uh, that's just the way it goes at something like this. Fortunately, we have this on a touch screen and we can change the color of the lights with just a touch of the button. We can do all sorts of like crazy effects, like sending the lights in all directions, just all the stuff you'd expect to see on a on a lighting control system. And um, there's also a hardware controller for the lights. I can slide my finger on these capacitive sensors and you can see there's like LEDs showing the current level. And it's just useful. We can like program buttons to do individual things like flashing all the lights or, you know, do cool strobe stuff for when the band takes a solo. And the nice thing about doing live sound is that if the sound check went well, everything should be pretty well set up. So you're free to uh, spend your attention doing lighting cues and uh, keeping your eye on that kind of thing, as long as the sound is just rolling along. So that's pretty much the tour of the booth here. So I'm going to head back to the stage. Ben now. Benjamin, are you doing monitors from there for the show too? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, larger venues will often have a separate monitor mixing engineer that's like off to the wings of stage or at some other location. But at a place like High Dive, the front of house engineer is also the monitor engineer mixer. So it's uh, just kind of one person doing it all. And it's can be a handful sometimes, but the more you do shows at that kind of scale, the more it just becomes second nature and it's uh, easy to keep all the balls moving. Does anybody have questions for Benjamin about the M32 while he's out there? Oh, I'm going to head back. Well, not if nobody has any questions, but. Well, I have a comment if uh, you can take that now. Go ahead. Sure. Um, uh, you mentioned the subwoofers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the idea of getting interference patterns from them for the basses. Um, an experience of mine many years ago was recording a, an organ student at Lewis and Clark College uh, doing mm. a pipe organ composition of his own making. And at one point in the composition, he flammed the bottom two pedal notes together. And you could hear this sound kind of rolling around you if you were listening to it live. The recording itself didn't show that up. And I spent some time trying to reproduce that um, by uh, having him record one note and then recording the other note and then putting one in one channel and one in the other and dubbing them back into the recording as needed. But uh, as I say, there's in some interesting phenomena that can come out of that. So, Sure. And as uh, as for the installation of the subwoofers here, I wasn't personally present at the time that they were setting up the subwoofers. I don't know how much testing they did to keep it physically in phase like that. But as you describe, it's it's really important, especially for long wavelengths in the in the bass frequency, because uh, since the waves are so much slower to to crest and trough uh, um, than high frequency stuff just things like physical distance can create noticeable and, and kind of slowly changing interference, which is not what you want unless you're trying to do a special effect as you described. I'll bet, I'll bet that sounded fantastic both in person. I hope you were able to uh, recreate the sound to your satisfaction in post. And while you're there, let's describe the physical layout of the club here. Gary, if you wanna hit the uh, camera too here, the booth. Sure takes up about half of the room maybe uh, on house left and maybe not quite half and then the other half is open for seating and uh, you want to wave Benjamin so you can we can see where you're in the booth there yeah I'd say the booth is about maybe seven feet wide by looks like maybe five feet deep yeah. uh, we moved it when we were shut down during the pandemic it used to be about 10 feet further forward which was really an awkward spot yeah. although not as awkward as so i know somebody mentioned while we were doing introductions at the start of this meeting that they're familiar with high dive going back before 2010 uh anybody that's that's been here a long time ago might remember that the uh quote unquote booth which was really just a desk used to be over on the the right wall directly against the wall which was maybe like the worst place possible to put it because you have this like 
giant unbroken wall directly by by your right ear and it was just very difficult to hear anything uh if you were had the misfortune of standing there trying to mix bands uh i'm very happy with the present location of the booth i think that it's uh right about the best spot to be hearing in the room and one of the the problems with the layout of this room as i kind of alluded to earlier is it's very narrow and and quite lengthy and this is about 30 feet wide, maybe, and about 60 feet long. I'd say it's probably a little longer than 60 feet. It might be more okay. like 30 and 80. Okay. But um, And half of it is the bar and booth, almost, almost half of it. And the rest is seating and standing. But even for, like, layouts such as this one, where the audio is maybe not the best it could be, it has unexpected benefits in, in this particular case. Uh, because people that are here to concentrate on the band and see what the, the band is doing, they'll stand in this area that's like either beside the booth or in front of it, and they'll be hearing the best quality of sound direct from the speaker with minimal reflections. And then people that are sitting in the uh, kind of like vinyl wrapped booths or in the corner booth at the far end of the room, uh, they're going to hear a much more muffled performance, which is not great if you care about listening with your full attention to the band but if you're just there to talk to your friends while the music is happening it's actually kind of nice that it's a uh, a little more muffled on the high end so people that want to sit way back uh don't bother the people that are that are here to concentrate on the music and people that are here to concentrate on the music get a, a better location to listen i'm um, i'm really spinning this as a positive i think it wouldn't be too out outrageous to say that uh, most people would prefer that if it just sounded great at every point in the room, but it's not the end of the world if there's some parts of your club that sound better than others. You know, people will will naturally gravitate towards where they can hear what they came to see. It's surprising but, how, how many people come to a club not to listen to the music that's being played, but to talk to their friends. Well, and seeing the speakers pointing down, it looks like people in the back of the room are out of the pattern which works fine for people who want to be up close and listen and that's something where when i was introducing this club in uh as as i've mentioned a couple of times the heart of fremont one of the things that we're proudest of at high dive is that this is a real central hub for the neighborhood some people have lived here for quite some time and uh there's a lot of walk-ins there's there's comparatively fewer people buying tickets far in advance at our shows and lots of neighborhood people just walk up which creates a a, a very sort of friendly vibe that i that i really appreciate here all right question somebody had from, a question here go ahead question from zoom land go ahead mm. uh you've got the subs under the stage and you've got three of them have you ever thought about putting them into a cardioid configuration I personally haven't thought about that because I'm not really an install person at uh, this particular venue. Uh, it's something that, now that you're mentioning it, is interesting to think about. But in terms of my role at High Dive, I'm somebody that wants to mix bands so that they can sound their best, given what we have, which is going to be a theme that I touch on in a little more detail in a moment. When you're working as... Uh, a, a live sound engineer at a smaller club, oftentimes you don't have the equipment that you would really like available. And the decisions that you have to make are how to make the most of what the club owner has set up. And that's why I wanted to give my presentation demonstrating on the Behringer X32 in particular, because that's a very low cost digital mixer comparatively. And I think that knowing some tricks for getting the most out of a low cost system is a, a valuable skill for people that are working on a on smaller scale or neighborhood venues. And to help answer Steve's question, the, the techniques for cardioid sub, making subs cardioid, all but one of them require some space behind the subs for the rear stuff to cancel out. This location here with the subs underneath the stage, there's no rear space behind it, and there's not enough space here at all to put them in any kind of end fire array in a row to, to come out into the room. So so that, that wouldn't be feasible here, really. Plus, it would require more amp channels and processing channels. Any other questions before we move on? 
All right, good, good, Benjamin. Thank you. Now he'll make his way to the front here. I've cracked the code on this occasionally misbehaving presentation. Sometimes I got to click and wait for it to uh, to advance. So there we go. All right, so I'm going to start talking about some things to keep in mind if you're interested in mixing live bands at a club like this one. And once again, it sounds like just from the introductions of everybody at this meeting that, that this may be familiar information to many of you, but I hope that you'll get something out of it anyway. So the most important thing when you're working in a live setting is always keeping an eye on the clock. Uh, of course, people that exclusively mix in a studio setting are aware that the clock's always ticking because people are often paying a lot of money for the studio time. But it's a different sort of time pressure at a live venue. And that is when the clock strikes whatever time has agreed to be doors or, or show time, uh, there will be strangers, there will be patrons in, in the room and they want to see music and, and more time isn't available if something is going wrong. So uh, I'd say the single most important thing to be paying attention to when you're mixing a live event at a place like this or, or any anywhere really live event is just keep an eye on the clock. You have to do everything with an eye towards how long is it going to take? Uh, what if something unexpected happens? How long will it take me to figure out? Do I have a buffer? It's just it's just paramount to keep an eye on the clock. And I don't know if we have a, a camera facing back towards the sound booth where I just left, but uh, to that end, we recently installed a clock that faces the stage. I don't know why we didn't have one earlier, but it's great to for, for me to keep an eye on while I'm setting up and for the bands to keep an eye on so that they know about uh, how much time they have left. So if you're setting up your own club, I'd really recommend getting a big digital display clock that is easily seen from the stage, even if somebody needs glasses and they're not wearing it because it ruins their look or whatever. Uh, keep an eye on the clock. And it's funny, I just said how important time is, and now I click my mouse on this presentation slide, it takes forever to come up. There we go. So one of the things that I've learned in all the shows that I've mixed here is that all the decisions I'm making when I'm setting up for a band, and it's it's very rare to have only one band performing in, in a night, we usually have several bands going back to back, is when I'm setting things up, I'm always keeping an eye towards what can I reuse? Because the set changes, if they go on too long, you might have patrons get bored and wander out, or it might throw off the schedule or squeeze the amount of time the headliner has available for their set. And you don't want that. So one of the things that I do when I'm setting up on this stage is as much as I'm paying attention to what microphones I'm choosing and where I'm choosing to set them up, I'm also paying attention to what what mic cables are going where, like which channel is laid out on which part of the stage. And something that helps me keep track of that at High Dive is using colorful XLRs like this one. I've got some orange ones and some yellow ones here. And I don't know why every club doesn't use colored XLRs because when you have just a bunch of black cables running everywhere, if there's some kind of problem or if things got tangled and you have to sort it out during a set change, you can waste so much time manually tracing cables back to their source. But if they're colorful cables and you paid attention to the colors you're using and where they ended up on stage, you already know what's what and it makes changing or debugging things a snap. For example, in my own scheme, I always set up wires or XLRs that are on the front of the stage in a particular color order. So my lowest number one, this might be channel five is red. Then I got channel six is green. Channel seven would be blue. If I had like channel eight, it'd be yellow. And I always keep the same color scheme for like sequentially numbered colors uh, because making it so that first of all, you're keeping track of colors and knowing where they are on stage. And second of all, always doing it the same from one show to the next means you don't have to think about it. You won't get it confused. You won't make a mistake. And if something unexpected happens, which 
you know, happens more often than any of us would like. Uh, you don't have to wonder, wait, what color did I use today? No, you have a plan, you have a usual scheme. So I think that that's really valuable. And another thing that somebody mentioned while we were setting up for this event was the idea about colored cables. Aren't, wouldn't they be more expensive for some reason? No, these are uh, cables by GLS Audio. They make excellent XLR cables. And if you're ordering them for your club, maybe you're placing an order for like $200 worth of mic cables. Getting the colorful ones is maybe a few dollars more in that order. So get colored cables. Oh dear, come on, there we go. Another thing that uh, should be pretty familiar to anybody that does live music is that you should backline gear whenever possible. Um, that's for those unfamiliar with the term backlining gear means setting up big heavy things like guitar amps or drum kits or keyboards or anything that's kind of a pain or needs two people to move. Instead of moving them off stage when the band's done and bringing other things out, um, when you're sound checking the bands in, in reverse order, so the headliner first, then the middle band, then the opening band, when you're done setting things up, just push it back against the wall, leave as many cables connected as possible. And that way, all you have to do is just nudge things back into place when it's time to do a set. It saves a lot of time. Of course, not every band is uh, comfortable with sharing their gear and it's going to be kind of individual from one group to an X. But in my experience, uh, I'd say like 85% or more bands are completely happy lending out their amplifiers and their equipment. Some people, some drummers are touchy about their snare drums and cymbals because they take the most abuse. But other than that, people are generally in a mood to do whatever it takes to make the show run more smoothly because it benefits absolutely everybody. The musicians, the engineers, the patrons don't get as bored. It's it's just a win-win all around to save time and share gear. What are the dimensions of this stage so that people can know how much you fit on it? This is not a Carnegie Hall or a... No, absolutely not. Um, I'm not sure of the dimensions off the top of my head. I could measure it using my phone app really quickly if we want. Uh, let's do that. Why not? Let's just walk from one end to the other. Looks like we're about 18 feet wide by looks like maybe 12 feet deep at the deepest. Uh, it's a pretty small stage. I'd say the most musicians we've ever had on stage at once has been maybe 13 or 14. And that gets pretty crowded. So... Um, I mean, with 13 or 14 musicians and all their equipment, there's literally not a square foot more available. But uh, fortunately, we're usually not at the limit like that. How long do your changeovers take? Mm, I shoot for less than 15 minutes. And uh, when I was first starting here and a little bit less experienced, sometimes they'd take as long as 20 minutes, which is not what I like. But now I'm able to do them usually in about 10 minutes because... Um, going back to what we were just talking about, I've made the decision to do things like always have the cables laid out in the same pattern or laying out extra cables that I that I know will be there. Just anything I can do to save time so I can just plug something in and run rather than uncoiling a cable, running it, connecting it, you know, possibly repatching things. I try to do as little repatching as possible these days. Um, Are but, you the only uh, sound engineer here? Or no, there's a there's about 10 of us currently, um, but I'd say that I do more shifts at high dive than anybody else in particular. Um, I've, I've been mixing a lot of shows here. I'm mostly on weekends and random stuff during the weekdays. And the kind of interesting thing about uh, venues that are set up the way ours is, is that even though we have a, a nice stable of, of engineers that are able to cover for each other and make sure that we get all the show coverage we need, uh oftentimes it's kind of hard for us to hang out with each other and 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 learn about each other because there's only one of us at work on any particular night and also we we live in Seattle where everybody's kind of antisocial so um the the going back a moment to something i was talking about with backlining is that like i said about 85% of the time or more people are happy to share their gear around but sometimes uh 
the the musicians aren't necessarily in the mood to share their gear amongst themselves. Of course, this is completely their prerogative, and you shouldn't do anything to coerce them into it. But something that I found is one of my most important skills when I'm working with a band on this stage is establishing a rapport with the musicians during setup right away. I like to be friendly. I like to tell jokes. Uh, I've told some really terrible jokes, but anything that makes me seem kind of goofy and like I'm on their team, like I'm here to have fun like they are, because later on, when a problem occurs or something unforeseen happens that nobody was expecting earlier, instead of getting stressed out, if I suggest the solution that I think would make things go most smoothly, they already see me as on their side about it. And there's less time spent convincing them because at the start, uh, I, I took the time to sort of be their friend. So I'm aware that there's kind of a stereotype among people that have been doing live sound for their whole career that that we're all uh, grouchy or grumpy or um, in in sort of permanently kind of a bad mood or deaf or something like that. Uh, and I really try to work against that because ultimately we are all on the same team. The band's here to put on a great show for the audience and the engineers to make them sound both as good as possible to the audience and as clear as possible to themselves on the monitors so that they don't have to wonder, hey, how is it we're actually sounding? So taking some of that stress out by keeping everybody on a sort of a friendly uh, bearing with each other, I think is really important and worth focusing on rather than just, you know, letting yourself be naturally how you are. I'd, I'd say take some time to really uh, uh, try to develop a little bit of rapport with people when you're setting up on them. It pays off when there's a problem. And even if there's no problem, it's just a more pleasant way to spend an evening, in my opinion. Hmm. And of course, keep an eye on the clock, I say, as I had to wait for that slide to load. It's really important. You, you should uh, be wearing a watch if you don't have the clock set up, but the clock's always ticking in live music, so keep an eye on it. Oh no, something happened and I ran out of time. Okay, so the first thing to do, especially if you're a, a little bit newer to the field, is keep a cool head. Um, when you're running overtime and doors are in five minutes and people are asking like, hey, are you done yet? It can be easy to get overwhelmed and that's just going to slow you down. It's going to scramble your brain and you're not going to be able to troubleshoot. So you're on short time or you're overtime, something's not working right, what do you do? Uh, and, and let's say that for the sake of argument that you're, that you're keeping cool and you're trying to be like, okay, how can I solve this problem? Uh, you start triaging details in your head. So some details uh, you can be willing to skip for the time being. Obviously, during a sound check, you want to check everything you can and get it so that every detail is sounding just right. But if you're really short on time, really what you want to concentrate on is, are the vocals clear and legible and high above the noise of all the guitar amps and, and stuff like that? And are the vocals not feeding back? And... Uh, are the is the band reasonably comfortable with the monitor mix you've set up if you have those three things nailed then everything else you take whatever time is available to, to work at but as long as you have those three things taken care of you're like most of the way there for your setup and anything that you uh have run out of time for as long as it's not one of those you can take care of by yourself later you can take care of quickly during like their first song during the set um, you can handle it when you get a chance, but as long as the basics are down, you can move on. I always think it's hilarious how I say things like move on or keep an eye on the clock and this slide takes forever to load. Is it pulling it off the internet or something? I don't know. Okay, so this next issue is something that I'll probably get in trouble if my boss is watching, so I hope that's not the case. But uh, pushing doors, uh, and by that I mean doors let's say doors were slated to open at eight sharp but it's 759 and you're in the middle of the song on soundcheck if you have whoever's running doors at your venue push it by five minutes it's not the end of the world i mean if it's always happening to you then that's a bummer but 
um if you have to do it once in a while it shouldn't make you panic and and be prone to make more more errors if if it takes a few more minutes to cook uh un unless you're in some place that has like blizzards all the time people aren't going to freeze to death waiting in line it's it's okay to push it a few minutes is there somebody at this venue who's riding you to get the doors open on time or whatever temporal things need to happen it's it's strongly encouraged to have doors open promptly but, but is there uh, somebody hassling you if they're if it's 801 and the doors aren't open if i ever hear about it it would be something that i'd hear about after the show but i think for the most part people understand that uh uh the engineers working your venue are responsible professionals and they're doing everything they can to keep things moving at, at the most reasonable pace they they can so there's not a production manager here then riding you we do have a production manager at this venue okay. and there's there's always the person who's also checking people in at doors but fortunately uh if i tell our production manager hey we're going to need five more minutes there's there's no pushback because you know we wouldn't be asking for it if we didn't need it and as i've mentioned five minutes isn't the end of the world when i said that um <laughs> i hope my boss isn't taking note of the fact that i'm saying yeah push the doors it's it's kind of like uh instruction from from more management on that like hey we got to open on time but uh as long as you're you're hitting your marks most of the times it's it's a, a mantra i like to repeat is it's live music you're you're making the best happen with the time you have available is there a curfew or anything here that puts a hard end time sure we have a hard end at 2 a.m here uh usually we're not bumping up against that but sometimes if we started late or if it's like a dj doing dance music just spinning all night we we mention it to them but uh the nice thing about being the audio engineer at the venue is if you're like two minutes away from hard curfew and the band or the dj or the performer doesn't want to stop when you hit that hard curfew you can just hit the mute button i mean it's it's rude it's it's kind of abrupt and i've only had to do that once or twice but uh you know as far as like who's in control of what's going to the speakers it's 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 you so uh as long as you're keeping to whatever whatever bylaws are set by the venue uh or the neighborhood or the sound ordinance or whatever you're dealing with uh you know you at the end of the day you're the one behind the mixer so you can you can make the decisions that need uh and actually that just ties into a last thing sometimes uh if you're behind schedule for whatever reason perhaps you had to push doors perhaps a set change took way longer than you anticipated um it's usually a good idea to prioritize your headlining band starting pretty close to the time that they expected to start because the later it gets the more people might decide they're all partied out for the evening and they might take off early and and if the band is headlining nobody wants to see the club empty just as they start the set it's really important to try to start the headliner of the night as close to whatever time they were supposed to start as possible and if you're under a time crunch and you're out of time don't be afraid to cut the opening band short i mean preferably not by just like hard muting them or something like that but if you can like you know wave at them blink the light once or twice uh usually bands will ask like hey do we have time for one more don't be afraid to say like no or uh yeah one as some of one of the, the hand gestures i like to use if a band says can we do one more and we only have like three minutes left or something like that as i'll go one keep it short and you know people understand uh opening bands that aren't just like jerks will get that they're there to support the headlining act and this goes back to what i said about being a salesperson if you've established that you're on their side you want their show to go well they're inclined to uh take direction and and uh suggestions from you it's all about keeping people on the same page and on the same team to have a, a successful and smooth night mm -hmm. Okay. When you're setting up a sound check, that's kind of what makes or breaks uh, whether or not your doors are going to be laid or if you're going to be all frazzled at the end of it. So it's a good idea to be on top of how your sound check is going to go and to uh, have a routine. I always set things up in the same order. I've, I've gotten my uh, routine down pat at High Dive. 
And what I'll do is when I walk in the building, if the band's, whether or not the band's already here, I'll turn on the lights, I'll turn on the system and, and all that. And I'll immediately start running XLR cables for the drum kit, which would be in kind of this region. I'm standing here backstage center. I'll use a, one of these bricks we have lying around to anchor XLR cables and I'll just kind of make a pattern. I use the colored XLR cables. I always use the same colors for the same types of drums and I just start laying them out. Uh, if it's a night where there's like four bands and everybody brought their own drum kits and there's just a ton of gear floating around, I'll tell whoever the headlining band is to start assembling their kit on the ground in front of the stage. That gives me time to lay out cables without having to like carefully step around all this like drum hardware that's all over the place. I'll lay out the cables, I'll set up the mic stands and, and plug things in. And then when I'm all ready to go, usually their drum kit is already assembled on the floor in front of stage. And I'll say, okay, bring it up now. And it just goes smoothly. And this doesn't happen just because I like, it occurred to me one day, I, I, I've been you know working here a number of years and just slowly I realized that's the most efficient way to do it. And now I never run out of time because I have a routine. Hmm. I guess I'll take this opportunity to ask if there's any questions at this point about anything I've said so far about setting things up. Yeah, you want to go come to up the to microphone, microphone there? Uh, go come to this one. It's on. That's a really good question. Uh, question was, do you wear earplugs? That one. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And the answer is whenever I can. Uh, to give you a little more insight into how I make that decision, uh, usually I won't wear earplugs during sound check. Uh, if things are just way too loud, as I've mentioned, we have a sound curfew here. So I'll usually tell people, hey, can we turn down the guitar amp? Going back to what I said about being a salesperson, I'll, I'll, phrase, it, I'll phrase it as a trade-off. I'll say, can we lose about 20% of the amp volume and I'll send you more in the monitors? That way they don't worry about like, oh, how will I hear myself? But it keeps the overall volume down. But as long as, long as things are comfortable enough during the sound check, I can do most of my preliminary mix without head, uh, earplugs. And then once the show gets going, usually I won't have earplugs in for the first song or if things are a little bit gnarly in the mix, maybe the first two or three songs. But usually I'm pretty happy with how things settle before too long into the set. And that's when I'll put earplugs in. And the other thing is um, I use uh, Loop Experience earplugs. I really recommend them because they take a little bit of the edge off without significantly distorting what you're hearing. Uh, they're not the kind of earplugs that are designed to just make things totally quiet. It just takes some of the edge off, which is, you know, no, some people use custom molded earplugs, but for the most part, the people that I run into that have custom molded stuff in their ears, usually it's part of like an in-ear system. Uh, I've never had the pleasure of trying custom molded earplugs for myself, but that's because I'm happy with the off the shelf ones that I use. I'm not feeling like, oh man, if only I could hear better. Again, I'm putting the earplugs in after I'm already pretty satisfied with the way the mix is going. And as long as I'm wearing those earplugs for like 85% of the night, I mean, I'm no audiologist, but I don't have tinnitus yet. Um, I don't think I have any significant hearing damage and the show gets mixed. I protect my hear hearing, and I've I've listened without earplugs at the start to get all the all the clarity details in. The one caveat is once I have earplugs in, I try not to make drastic mix decisions at that point. If I feel like oh something's way off, I'll like pop one out to listen to what I'm doing. If I if I'm going to make like a big level adjustment or or a big change, but um, fortunately, most of the big decisions are made during sound check, and uh, you should just kind of ride the good wave you set up for yourself once once the show's actually going two That's, questions yeah. one what what's the name of the earplugs again oh these are loop is the brand and l e the, l o o p okay and experience is the model number so it's like loop experience uh they're pretty cheap i think they're like 20 or 30 bucks uh i got mine on amazon and 
if you, <laughs> I promise they're not paying me to say any of this stuff, but if you look into it, uh, they have the experience and the experience pro models. And the only difference is the experience pro comes with a number of different tips to, to fit your ears precisely. And they also have, a uh, a little rubber donut thing that you kind of put in them that which can make it mute a little bit better they're really comfortable and the other question was how do you monitor the sound level oh yeah well um i'm going to run over to a sound booth really quickly i'll be right back with something okay Sorry, Dan, was that directed to me? I missed I was it. talking to the people in the room here. So uh, most clubs should have something like this. Got a SPL meter. And uh, I don't know much about the, oh, did we lose lights there? Something happened? What's the brand? Oh, the brand on this is Reed, R-E-E-D. And uh, it's just a basic piece of equipment. Uh, I make sure that I have it set to C weighted instead of A weighted, which is a little more responsive to bass frequencies. The reason that we have this meter is because we have made agreements with our neighbors in Fremont that we're going to keep it under a certain sound level. And the reason we use C weighting is because since that's especially responsive to bass frequencies, usually the bass is what neighbors are going to complain about. So that's why we set the standard to it. And uh, it's just an important tool to have available. Uh, with, I, with all due respect, 110 dBC does not seem like much of a limitation in my world. Uh, that's pretty loud. And indeed, and it is pretty loud. You, you've got uh, six 18s here and two mid-high boxes. So there's a, a ton of sound coming off of the low end. And possibly less amplitudinally coming out of the of the mid highs. And I'm, I'm curious if you've ever done a weighting to see how that compares. Well, I'm going to uh, actually answer a, a different question that you had on that. Okay. And when I'm measuring the 110 dBC limit that I talked about, first of all, we're usually not hitting that. I like to have my levels at like 107, 108. And second of all, it's worth remembering that the location that we're measuring from is just about 20 feet away from the speakers. And when I've mentioned that this is a long, narrow club and a lot of the highs fall off due to the geometry of the room, that 110 dBC reading, when you're actually standing outside and not just directly out the door, but like where neighbors live is pretty pretty attenuated by that point so that that high measurement is because we're right in front of the speakers and measuring right at it so. understood have you gone out and measured outside you've got a busy road there which mm -hmm. is going to mask yeah a absolutely lot. so it's um it's something where obviously i'm not standing there the entire night holding the meter looking at it i have no. more important things to worry about but once or twice during the show i like to take a measurement and really what I use more than this meter are just my ears, which is not as scientific. It's I know we're, we're in the audio engineering society meeting, but um, something that I'm going to touch on more and more as I talk is that all the tools in the world can help you get specific about things, but you should use your ears. You should use your own good judgment. And if I pop out my earplug for a second, if I'm making a mix decision or if I'm just checking how it's going, uh, if I like recoil in pain or go, ah, uh, that's just a clear sign that it's way too loud because not everybody in the audience is going to be wearing earplugs. And if it's painful to listen to, that's not good. So, um, you know, if, if, if you're mixing at such a level that it, you're like flinching from it, then something's wrong. Turn it down a little bit. Are there people other than the people next door who, who complain? Oh, I'm not going to name names. We have no, I don't we I'm have, not asking for names, but how far <laughs> away is the nearest person who complains? We have uh Other those than the business we have more businesses on the actual block that we're on, but just across the street there's condos and uh, uh apartments. So some and, and also behind the club there's some people living too. Mm -hmm. I I would venture to guess they're two hundred feet or more away from the club. Uh and so that helps. Yeah, it's just an occasional 
issue uh we've we've gotten to a point where since we're pretty regular about the sound level we cap at it's it seems to be more or less okay for everybody involved great going back to what's going to make make a successful and speedy sound check is to start by having a routine of course and then we're going to talk about a few more specific strategies you can use while you're setting it up uh one is when you're starting to bring up the preamp gain on the individual microphones and channels always lowball it don't don't be going near the the top of the uh, threshold for the preamp staging because uh, a simple fact and whether you're working in live sound or studios i think most people have experienced this is that singers will go like check check la la one two three and then when they're actually performing they're going to be giving it all they got and that goes for both you know vocalists performers drummers anybody that's not playing like pre-recorded tracks back or or like a sampler or something is almost always going to play louder than they play during sound check just because the energy and the adrenaline is higher so leave room um another thing that i find myself doing uh on sound checks is that if the band has let's say it's a a, a mid-sized or bigger band that has like three brass players you got like a trumpet a trombone and a saxophone is sure i'll check every instrument individually and then at the end i'll say can i get a horn trio and have all three of just them playing or i might have like if a band has two electric guitarists standing at either edge of the stage, I'll, I'll check them individually, check their monitors, and then say, can I get the two of you playing together? And the question I always ask after checking a section is, can you hear yourselves and each other distinctly? Um, it's, it's easy for people to hear themselves on the monitors when they're the only person playing, but when their similar sounding instrument buddy that's kind of in the same section, if you will, is playing along with them, sometimes it can get muddied. And I know that this is something that bands pick up on because a comment that I frequently get from bands at the end of the show is, wow, things sounded so clean and clear on stage. That's because I took the time to have similar instruments play together at the end of checking them individually to make sure that both the audience mix gets them distinctly, but more importantly, that the stage monitor mix gets them so they can hear both themselves and everybody else at the level they like. Uh, don't forget to EQ and pan your channels. Again, pretty basic stuff. It only takes a second to do, but I'm always surprised at the, uh, how often I see a, another engineer at a club like this uh, as they're, if I'm I'm kind of peeking over their shoulder as they're going on the on the console, they'll have like, the the high pass or low cut filter on a channel which good for them you know you always want to take out those really low frequencies that you don't need but the rest of the digital eq is flat uh take the time you know bring out the stuff that's particularly prominent that that you want to cut through uh cut down on everything else i mean this is just audio mixing 101 but i'm amazed at how little i see live engineers do that for for live shows all the studio people will take all the time in the world to get the eq just perfect you know in in both both in terms of the uh live tracking and in the mix down later but I'm always surprised how, how little I see that in live. So take the time to EQ and to pan. You can always use panning as a way to further separate stuff that you want distinctly. It's, it's funny because when you're mixing live, you're not listening on headphones. So you can pan perhaps a little harder than you might for your uh, at home or studio recording because it's all going to, to you know, bounce together in the room. But by, by panning a little harder than you might otherwise, you're creating separation one strategy i use a lot is that uh i i often have guitar amps set up in the corners like the far corners of stages and i will pan the guitar signal pretty hard to whatever the opposite side of stage the amp is on because the amp itself is pretty noisy but if you uh pan their signal to the other side of the of the main speakers that creates it so if somebody's like walking back and forth across the room they're not going to be like well i can hear the guitar here but not over here so uh, it's, it's important to take advantage of these tools you have on modern digital mixers where every channel's got its own four band EQ and, and panning, use them. Another thing that I wanna talk about when, if you're out of time and you just gotta keep things rolling is you can always compress later. Um, I think it's important to compress things like, you know, kick drum, snare drum, uh, vocals tastefully, whatever you wanna use a compressor on, sure. But if you're spending all the time for every individual channel setting up all the compressors just right, that actually eats up a lot of time. Uh, and if you're short on it, I'd say 
prioritize getting the EQ correct rather than getting the compressor correct. You can set up the compressor during the set. This is the last time I'm going to use Google presentation or whatever. Okay, troubleshooting. Once again, the clock's always ticking. Keep an eye on that clock. But when something goes wrong, uh, it really throws a wrench in your plans, especially if you don't have that much time left before doors. So have uh, an idea in mind about what to do when you don't get signal on that one channel. I've made uh, a complete non-scientific list of what I find to be from more common to less common, the causes of no audio on a channel. And if you kind of memorize this order of things to check, you're not spending your own brain power uh, uh, being like, well, what about this? What about just run down this list? You might go faster. Check to see if there's phantom power, if it's appropriate to the type of mic being used. Some DIs also require phantom power. It's, it's worth taking a look at that. Uh, check to see if the physical connection to the snake on the wall is bad. I know on high dive stage, I have no idea how old these panels are, but they're pretty shaky. And if you sometimes things might get a little loose, just check that. Maybe the uh, signal cable you're using, like the XLR of a quarter inch is bad. If you think that's the case, don't waste time testing it. Just swap in a new cable. But as I'll get to in just a second, the cable that you suspect might be bad, keep it with you. Don't, don't just throw it back in the general stack. Uh, the microphone itself might be bad. We're starting to get into pretty less common stuff. But if you're, you're still out of things, just try sw swapping the mic. Who knows, that might fix it. Usually it's not that the capsule on the mic itself has failed or the mic is like catastrophically broken. Usually it's just like at, at clubs like this compared to recording studios, the mics are usually pretty beat up. They get a lot of action every night. And, you know, depending on the kind of music that plays at the club, maybe it's the kind of bands that like to throw mics around or uh uh be be like punks on stage which is cool to watch and i'll never uh never complain about but these mics get get thrown through the worst of it and sometimes the uh the the prongs that are on like the male end of the mic might have become like broken solder inside or detached or maybe the 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 ring on the xlr isn't mating correctly to it if you suspect that a mic is bad just swap the mic out and carry the mic that you pulled with you you can test it later but you don't want to just throw it back in the general supply because you'll never find it later um and finally maybe the maybe the musician's instrument is bad maybe their pickups have gone crap or they're having some kind of problem never waste time troubleshooting this if you suspect that the musician's instrument is what's giving you the problem find out if they can borrow one from somebody else again about 85 percent of bands will be more than willing to help each other out like that because everybody wants the show to go on don't waste your own time trying to to be a guitar tech you're the audio engineer and you got to keep things moving you, you can't as interesting as some of these problems might be and i myself am guilty of this plenty of times don't spend the time trying to diagnose somebody else's equipment that you've never seen before instead you should spend the time waiting for the next slide to load yeah you know i'm going to start doing that that's a good idea uh, yeah, as I already mentioned, quarantine suspected bad gear. Take it with you to the sound booth. Uh, if if the show's going well and you don't need to like be messing with the faders all the time or or going crazy on the lights, you can take a little bit of time during the set itself to 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 take a closer look at some of this stuff. We have a cable tester. Uh, Behringer makes a cheap one. Big surprise. And this is a, a invaluable tool to have something like this available in your sound booth because all those suspected bad cables or suspected bad mics, you can just plug it into the sockets on this and see if everything's looking okay. And if it is at the end of the show, you can throw it back in the general supply. If it isn't, you should tag it somehow like with red or pink tape or Sometimes I'll like print out a blank, a blank receipt at the bar and wrap it around a cable and tape it shut and like write on a Sharpie like bad and then my name and the date. Uh, keep stuff that you think is bad away from the general supply of things. I'm going to start pressing that button sooner. I'm going to do it. Uh, test cables during the show. Great. Another thing is while the show is happening, all the stressful stuff should be behind you. Uh, when, when you're really getting your workout 
mixing a live band at a venue like this is during the sound check and hopefully everything went well and during the show itself you're just kind of babysitting the mix but don't check out entirely um a question that i ask myself while i'm sitting in the booth during a set is what if i were listening at home yeah we're in a club with a big sound system you know you can feel the bass pounding in your chest but uh, something i like to imagine is what if this mix were perceptually a lot quieter and I was listening on my home speakers or on headphones at home? I, I ask myself, can I hear the words the singer is singing? Can I hear like the actual attack of the guitar notes? I ask myself, if I were just putting this album on at home, would I say, hey, I can't hear stuff? And I, I think that asking yourself that question, like kind of putting yourself in a different location is a great way to take yourself out of just what you've been hearing and, and refocus your attention to really listening to what's presently happening. Um, something else that I like to do to stay engaged is uh, I like to keep an eye on the stage because you never know, as much as I, I hate when this happens, you never know when the band's going to say, we'd like to welcome our friend from the previous band back on stage. And you had no idea that was going to happen. And all of a sudden, somebody else is taking the vocal mic that you've painstakingly EQ'd for the singer of this band. Uh, if you weren't paying attention over in the booth, you're going to miss it and it's going to cause a hiccup. So just make sure you're there watching the show and not just having your, your head in the clouds. Uh, another thing that I put in this section for staying engaged is most modern digital consoles and x32 m32 is no exception will have a pretty decent fast fourier transform on their eq page for uh those who may not be familiar that's when you got all the all the bars going up and down on the screen it's something that didn't always used to be a thing back back in ye olden days of audio engineering but it's so amazing when you can see I mean, you should use your ears to to identify where problem frequencies are, but sometimes you can be like, there's a problem somewhere between 500 and 600. Pull up the FFT and it's going to tell you exactly where it is. And also, if you're having feedback or other issues, it's always going to spike right there on the FFT. And, and some people are more visual and I like just seeing it and it just lets me see right away there's a problem other than hearing it. It keeps, it keeps my attention focused on what's happening in the show. Um, and finally, uh, we all know that when the show is is going, or let's be honest, a little bit on the boring side, uh, you can pull out your phone just to keep oxygen flowing to your brain. But don't be too obvious about it. Sit in the sound booth if you got if you got your phone and you're like reading some article and and this is all assuming everything's going great if things aren't going great what you should be doing is fixing it but if everything's going well and you're just a little distracted from the show and you got to pull out your phone you know keep it under the lip of the booth nobody nobody on stage wants to see their sound guy just uh, or their sound person just like totally checked out mentally Dan, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're chugging along. Okay, great. Let's go to the camera. I'm gonna. These are all my general tips that I've shared with running sound on this, but I'd like to show off a few things that are specific to the uh, uh, M32 and X32 consoles. Now, why am I showcasing this model or models of Mixer in particular? As I mentioned, especially the Behringer X32 is a really inexpensive but highly featured digital console. Um, uh, it's, it's absolutely everywhere, particularly at smaller clubs. So if you're, if you're mixing rooms like this, you'll probably see one of these consoles. So I wanted to show off some tips that are specific to it. And these these slides are for my notes. So if we can, can we go to the camera showing off the X32? All right, thanks. So uh, I mentioned how important it is to compress things if you're able to. Something that I see a lot of people miss on the X32, M32 system, by the way, for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to call it the X32 from here out, uh, is over on the dynamics page where you're looking at your, if you have like, some sort of compressor setup. Let's just say you're whatever. Here, you got some compressor, right? Um, this up and down arrow, make sure people can see that. This up or down arrow will swap what page you're on. There's a little one, two thing. Go to page two. There is a wet dry mix that I see a lot of people miss. 
there's a knee option here. Um, and most importantly, you can set up a side chain. Now, I use side chain compression in a live setting a little bit differently from how a lot of studio people will do on mix downs. And that's because unfortunately, the way the X32 is set up is that you only get one compressor per channel. If you really need more compressors, you can like do fancy things like route your channel to a bus all on its own and use that bus's compressor as a secondary compressor. But I never do any of that stuff. You get one compressor and the traditional way to compress things is to use its its own source as a as you know the threshold signal level for the compressor but something that i like to do a lot is i will set side chains up for like guitar amps that are side chained to the lead vocalist so that whenever they're singing you know past a certain threshold it just ducks things like maybe one or two or maybe three decibels it just gets it out of the way a little bit and you'll find all that stuff on page two of this However, on the X32 system, it's a little bit confusing the way that it's laid out. So I'll just show briefly. If you wanted to set this channel, channel nine, to listen to, let's say your vocals are on channel 11, you scroll down here, you pick channel 11 as the key source. And then if you want to get extra fancy with it, you turn the fifth encoder here. It says slope Q. If you turn it all the way, you'll see that you can pick these different options that are right here. I want to, is that coming across on the camera? Sort of. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit washed out, but you can see it has like, uh, you know, low cut, six decibels per octave, 12, high cut, six and 12, and then um, a, a band pass option with a variable uh, slope or, or quality factor. And once you, like, oftentimes I'll use, you know, some sort of low cut and then set the filter frequency with this fourth encoder. Uh, and just the way that it's laid out on this, I've always thought was sort of peculiar, but play around with it on your own system. It's all there on page two of the compressor. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that you can use on the X32 system is there's many effects that are built in. Uh, people should be familiar with things like reverb and delay, using slapback delay and all sorts of things like that. But there's actually quite a few of, of, of various digitally modeled things in the effects section. Uh, I find most of them to be not especially useful and I never use them, but it's worth being aware of them. One of the ones that I use all the time is the dual de -esser which I usually set up as an insert bus. So I have it here in slot number five. You'll notice that FX slots one through four are all set up as um, uh, uh, send effects by default. Slots five through eight are set up as inserts. So if I have the de -esser on FX slot five, you can um, select what channel it's listening to, and then be sure to press this button so that it's on. And then if you page over to, to look at the settings for it, it's got settings for female and male vocals. I've never totally understood what's different. Perhaps it's paying attention to different frequencies, but I play along with whatever they have set up and I just have that match. And you have low band de -essing. And usually what you use a de -esser for is like that tss -tss stuff. And that's all in the high band. And I usually set them about like, low single digits low band and maybe 15 to 20 on high band and it's a better solution than just shelving out the highs on the channel because that's going to just lose clarity overall i don't know exactly what algorithm this de-esser is using i've i've never like looked into it from a from a you know designer point of view but just as a live audio engineer i find that it's really helpful so pay attention to that dual de-esser Another thing that I like to do when I'm looking at effects is on a slot eight, I'll use the uh, stereo true EQ as my master EQ for the room. I'd like to take a second to talk about this, uh, especially with people asking questions about the particular subwoofers and speakers that we're using here at High Dive. A lot of times at smaller clubs, um, they don't have some sort of amazing sounding system. I'm I'm pretty lucky here at High Dive. I think things sound pretty good here. 
but anywhere you're mixing, whether it's like some cafe or even a, a kind of decently mid-sized venue, people are going to have their own opinions about what makes the the overall system sound its best. And I can't recommend enough that if you if you just picked up a gig somewhere new, first of all, congratulations, but see if you can spend the time as soon as possible to come in during the afternoon before they're open and play back some recorded music from from a band that you've heard a million times, the recording you've heard lots of times on lots of different speakers, hopefully play it back and tune the uh, master EQ to what you think it should sound like. Because if it's a recording that you know well, that you think was mixed well, um, then hopefully you think that in its its default, just here's the waveform, here's the signal. It, it should be mixed pretty evenly. So if you mix the uh, sound system at, at the venue, uh, and, and hopefully you're doing this on your own scene and you're not like changing somebody else's settings, but if you change the uh, uh, graphic EQ, on the system to whatever you think is making your your favorite recording sound how you expect it to sound that's a great starting point so that when you're eqing individual channels of a band uh you're not thinking like oh well i have to mix the bass low because this room is bassy you've already controlled for how you want the bass response in the room to be because you have this master eq set up and you can just focus on making individual channel EQ decisions based on just what you're hearing at the time. You're not second guessing yourself wondering, oh, is it just the room? Uh, one trick that is worth pointing out on the X32 is if you hit this first encoder button, if you press it in, it says global EQ on faders. It will change this bank of faders to uh, be a live representation. And for people that like to play with their hands a little more, um, it can be easier to do than to just like dial in numbers. Maybe it'll save you some time. Maybe you don't want to mess with it, but it's there. Another thing I'd like to take a look at on the X32 system is uh, some tricks you can do involving advanced decisions about digital signal routing. Oftentimes, I see more and more bands will tour with their own in-ear monitor rig and an analog splitter. And in case you're not aware, what that implies is that instead of having all of the microphones and sources on stage plugged directly into our system and then sending signal back through our system to the stage monitors, they'll have an analog splitter that they have all their microphones or our microphones if they're using them, plugging into something that splits the signal without, without processing it, without converting it to digital. It's just like... Uh, uh, running the the mic wires in parallel basically and they'll send the outputs from that system into our system for the for the live mix and they'll send the other set of outputs of that into their own digital system usually a rack mount x32 they're very popular um and, and they'll they'll be running their own in-ear monitor broadcast system that way so why does this matter as I mentioned, you can spend a lot of time during setup and changeover, and when one band, and it's often the headliner, although it's especially grown worthy when it's like the middle band, has a splitter system like that, that might make you feel like, oh no, I have to repatch absolutely everything right in the middle of my show. That's going to take forever, and I might make a mistake and misplace a cable, and then either it's going to cause a problem or I'll waste even more time troubleshooting it. Recently, I've been starting to, when, when one of the bands is using an in-ear broadcast system with their own analog splitter, I'll have all the tails from that analog splitter go into a whole set of channels that are like past the set of channels I usually use for all the microphones. They're at the end. So like starting with like, I don't know, number 20, 20, 21, 22, all the way through like, I don't know, 30, 32 or whatever. And they're, they're patched at the end. And instead of wasting a bunch of time um, setting up like separate mixes on, on different pages of banks of faders on this, I'll go to a channel that I have selected. Let's say I have channel 16 selected here. And over on the home page, you move one tab over to config and then source. 
And, and the location of this is more to the left on the M32 system. I mentioned that the interface is not identical, but it's pretty close. You look for where it says source and you can find a, a different hardware source set up. And when I'm creating a scene for the headliner of the band, if they're using an analog splitter that I've plugged in all their tails at the end of the scene, I'll just pick for all the channels I want to mix. I'll, I'll take that input to be on a different channel. And that way I don't have to repatch anything. It saves a lot of time and it can be a little bit confusing to wrap your head around the first time you do it. But pretty soon you'll, you'll realize that this is actually making things safer because you're, you're taking off uh, a very complex step where it's easy to get something confused and make a mistake. Um, another thing that I like to do with routing is let's say somebody's making a recording of what's going out from the board uh, plugged into their Zoom recorder or their computer or whatever they're used to make a recording of is I'll take a look over at the XLR pay out page on routing and I'm sorry, I wanna actually look at the out one through 16 page. And if I have like the XLRs out to their recording device, let's say I'm on Benjamin, we should really zoom in on that screen. If you're going to spend, I'll come up and do it. But if you're going to, are you going to spend much more time? Yeah, I have, I have one or two more slides on, um, on X32 specific things. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, hopefully that even though the screen may be a little bit washed out, it's, it's visible enough. And right now, right now we're just looking at probably the most detailed thing I'll show on the screen. So thanks for coming up and taking a look at that, Dan. Yeah, no, you're fine. Um, output 13 and 14, I'll have as a, I mean, I'll use 15 and 16 as my outputs to the actual sound system at the venue. And 13 and 14, I'll also have as main left and main right. The difference is I'm tapping it pre-fader for those. Uh, maybe during the show, you find that things are just a little too loud and quiet and you're jogging the master fader on the venue on the on the uh, system to adjust the overall sound level. But if somebody's recording, they don't want to deal with the overall level jumping around during that. So that's why when I'm doing hardware output for recording, um, I always make sure that I'm tapping it pre fader on those outputs. Finally, I'll tell you a story about something that I got really excited about the way the X32 works at first, and then found out that actually it's usually not a good idea. And that is the AES 50 digital protocol. That's uh, a situation that sometimes might seem like a good idea to use if the band has brought their own X32 system, whether it's rack mounted or an actual mixer. Uh, you might say, wait a minute, why would I spend all this time running all these analog tails into my system? After all, wouldn't wouldn't the signal be going from analog to digital, back to analog, back to digital, and, and lose signal quality from the resampling and spend all that time patching it? Why wouldn't I just hook up an Ethernet cable to the AES50 port and uh, have the, have the uh, two X32 systems transport that digital audio data uh, that way? Well, the answer is because if something goes wrong, it will go wrong spectacularly. And it'll usually have a hard digital cut on the overall sound system. And I had that happen to me at a show that I worked about a year ago, where somebody was like, I, I told the band, I said, we should probably run this cable overhead so that nobody steps on it. And they said, oh, it'll be fine. It's an, it's an armored cable. Guess what? It wasn't fine. Somebody stepped on it. It caused some kind of clock to go out of sync. And during the middle of the set, the, the main audio just went and went quiet because all of a sudden the two clocks of the system weren't synchronized anymore. It didn't have a way of, of transporting the, the audio packets uh, back and forth in any way that made sense. So nothing could happen. So we had to scramble and, and repatch things and it's just no good. So uh, I'd say that using the AES 50 protocol is really neat if you have some sort of permanent installation. For instance, at a larger venue that has both a monitor and a main mixer that are talking to each other, it can be a great 
convenient idea. But if you're setting it up ad hoc for just that one band that's coming through, I would recommend against using that and just use the uh, analog tails because ultimately uh, reliability beats like cool features when it comes to live audio. Okay, um, I believe the last thing that I wanted to talk about on the X32 specifically was using uh, snippets in particular. Most people are familiar with using scenes. Are we... Okay, we have a, a scenes button is kind of on the right side of the console. And of course you can see a list of scenes that you've saved, which is a lifesaver when you have multiple bands, you wanna save just that scene for the band, you know, save the headliner, save the whatever you're doing. Everybody's familiar with scenes on a digital mixer. But I find a lot of people aren't using snippets. And for me, they are a vital part of my workflow. I use them every day I come to work. And uh, I was having a little bit of an issue exporting all of my snippets from our house M32 to my personal X32 I brought for this demonstration. But I mocked up one or two so you can see how useful it is. Um, something that I have set up is I have many different drums snippets set up according to a kit. I have a, a drum snippet set up for when they just have a rack tom and a floor tom. I have a different one set up for when they have two rack toms and a floor. I have one set up for when they have like a snare and a secondary snare, like maybe a timbale or something. Just the most common drum layouts I've seen. I've made a snippet for that. What is a snippet? It's kind of like a scene with a very limited scope. So if I load, the snippet that I've called demo drums here. Um, hey Dan, could we could we zoom out a little bit on this? We're we're getting out of like this screen important stuff. I want to show something that's showing some of these faders. I just want to look at um just just some of the faders from about here on. Yeah, that's good. So I'm going to load this uh, demo drum snippet, and you'll see I've loaded just a few channels worth of settings. They all, uh, they all have the EQ and the, I uh, didn't set up dynamics on this demo, but they could have had the dynamics set up. The EQ's loaded. I, I can have like pan loaded or even fader position and, and, and gain staging, whatever you want to uh, load, but it's not a complete scene. So that way I can load just the drums that match whatever the band brought that night. And it saves a lot of tedious setup time. That's like, five minutes maybe off of your sound check, which might not sound like a lot, but again, when you're under a time crunch, it can be the difference between pushing doors five minutes and not. Um, the one problem with the X32 system as it relates to snippets is that you can't save a snippet using um, all the channels that you have selected that are part of that snippet. You can see, yeah, yeah, let's zoom back in on that. You can see that my drums is is been set up to use channels nine through fourteen, and and indeed you saw that we loaded on channels nine through fourteen. But what if you needed to move it around? Well, unfortunately, the only way to do that is we'll load the bass here, and it's going to show up on channel seven, which is not where we wanted it. So if you go to the home page, press the utility button, you can hit copy, and then just copy the channel over and. It's kind of a kludgy workaround, but it doesn't it doesn't take long. So snippets, use them. Uh, and again, that's kind of a thing that if you're working a new gig at a at a new venue and you're coming in to take the time to set up the master EQ the way that you like for that room, take some time to set up some snippets for things that you think you'll commonly see. And uh, as as you work shows. If you find yourself seeing the same setup again and again, maybe store it as a snippet. It's just for saving time. Well, I have one more thing I'd like to talk about on the X32. This is the uh, the last part of the, my presentation that's specific to this unit, and that is matrices. Matrices are a concept that I don't see people use very often all the time. Oftentimes it's something that whoever's in charge of the venue or whoever installed the system might have set up for people, but people aren't using it on their own. Um, one way, you know, can we, can we just zoom out just a little bit? Um, let's just, let's just get this in frame. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
there's a lot of differences of opinion for live engineers about whether or not to set up subwoofers as something using the mono center channel independently of the main left right mix or whether to integrate the subwoofers as part of the main left right mix personally i like the subwoofers to be integrated in the main left right mix but there's no right or wrong way about that it's it's a matter of personal preference um in the case of high dive we have our subwoofer outputs happening on their own channel. As I mentioned earlier, our main mix is heading out of outputs 15 and 16, but our subwoofer is coming out of output 12. So since I one way to do that would be to set up your routing so that your mono center channel is what's going out to output 12, and then you can mix your, your sub level individually using that mono center channel. Uh, Dan, I believe that's how you like to have your system set up. Yeah, yeah you like to use it. And, and lots of other engineers, even at High Dive and at our sister venue at Nectar, prefer it that way. But if you're like me and you like to have your subs integrated into your main left-right mix, one, one way I've found to do that is to use matrices. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, you can think of a matrix as a super bus. You know, if you think hierarchically, you have a number of channels available you can send them to the next tier, which is buses. Maybe you have this or that amount of, of this channel going to one bus and uh, going to another bus. But at the end of it are matrices, which is basically another level of buses. And we can think about the main left-right mix as being a pair of matrices. I'm sorry, as a, as a pair of buses. And we can send that if we have the main left right mix selected if you go over to the sends page you'll see a short list of our six matrices that are available in this case i've got matrix 4 set up uh, i'm sorry this is what one second please i've got matrix 4 set up as my subwoofer matrix and in this case i'm just sending a full copy of everything that's going to the main left right bus to matrix 4 and then over on matrix four, I just EQ out everything above like 150 or 200 Hertz and it's sort of like a cheap fake crossover. And then over on my routing page, I'll have output 12 that heads to our subwoofers listening to matrix four. And the upshot of all of this is that now when I'm mixing, all I care about is if I'm changing the channel fader, you know, that's being sent to the main left, right mix, the amount that's being to a subwoofer is coming right along with that because the subwoofer is just getting a copy of the main left, right mix with all the highs cut out. Um, one last technique I'll talk about with matrices that I find comes up from time to time is especially if we're doing a recording of the show that isn't a multi-track recording. In other words, that isn't uh, a recording that's that's grabbing every individual input channel for a later mix down. They just are getting the left, right, what's going to the mains. Sometimes there's a problem with loud rock bands where the drums on stage are really loud and the guitar amps on stage are really loud and the singer, even though they're giving it all, just can't compete with the actual physical loudness of those instruments that are on stage. So on your main mix, what you do is typically you have the drums at a much lower level and the guitars at a much lower level because for the people that are with you in the room, they're hearing the loudness of the instruments themselves on stage and they don't need much help from the main PA system. But the vocals and other quiet instruments might be quite loud in the actual mix. So if you just record a copy of what's going out to the main left right mix, they'll listen back and it'll just be vocals on top of everything or all, all the quietest bits will just be way louder than everything else. One way you can use matrices or matrices to get around this problem is set up an unused pair of buses on your X32 to basically be like a, an overflow helper bus for for quiet instrument or i'm sorry for loud instruments on stage and to make that make a little more sense i mean i i'll have my drums set up i'll have the the faders set for the drum channels at whatever's comfortable to listen to in the room and then i'll send those loud instruments at an appropriate level to this extra bus which is not part of the main mix people are listening to 
But if you use a matrix, you send the main left-right mix at, at its full level to the matrix, and then you also send in this overflow bus you set up to the same matrix, and it adds presence for really loud instruments on stage that you don't want to overwhelm people that are in the room with, but you don't want to just disappear on the recording. It's a little bit of a hassle to set up, and really, if you have that much of a problem, you would hope that the band would bring like a laptop and they're doing a multi-track recording for themselves to mix later. But if, you, if you're if you doing a recording of your thing and it's important to fix this problem, or more importantly, if you're live streaming the show for some reason, we did this a lot during the pandemic at High Dive, for example, uh, you, you'll want to make sure that your overall mix isn't grossly distorted from what you'd hear in the room. And one way you can do that is having that extra bus available to add to your matrix and then record from the matrix rather than just your, ma your master left right mix. Whew, I covered a lot having to do with X32. Are there any questions about anything I talked about? We can cut away from the Anybody camera. I'm not gonna use this anymore. How are we doing out there on Zoom land? I can't hear any of you directly. I had a, a question or a comment. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever use an iPad or other device to walk around the room and check things as well besides just being at your desk? Now, personally, I don't use an iPad as often as I should. I'll use an iPad at uh, private gigs that I work where I'm setting up like an ad hoc sound system like speakers on tripods you know at a at a wedding or a special event or something like that and i'll i'll, I'll primarily mix on the ipad just because sometimes it can be hard to set up a, a sound booth at a at an ad hoc gig like that uh but as far as like using an ipad so that i can adjust things on stage without having to hustle over to a booth to do that i should do that more often than i do but I, I work at High Dive a lot, and the sound booth is only 20 feet away, and I'm getting my steps in for the day, so I'll just hustle over there. So uh, I'd say do as I say and not as I do on that one. Can I offer a counter uh, comment on that? I'm almost always mixing on iPads now, mm -hmm. and I enjoy it a lot. And it is much easier for me, and I often mix front of house with three iPads mm -hmm. uh, to have various aspects of the console available to me. And it's it's a great thing. You can walk up to the stage and be there with one iPad and do the sound check and then go out front and mix on three for the show and no wires. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with Dan. Uh, another really common use of iPads for uh, live sound is you can ring out feedback and adjust it live while on stage. Um, not to sound overly arrogant, but I've got a pretty good sense about what problem frequencies are in this room in particular and at other clubs that I work often. So I find that it's not as necessary for me to do that. But Dan is absolutely right. It's It saves time, it saves running around, and uh, uh, there's no reason not to do it if you have an iPad and, and you're inclined to use it that way. You have to pay a lot of attention to your Wi-Fi connectivity because if the iPad goes out, you're screwed. Dan brings up a really good point. Uh, something that I know not everybody is aware of is that most commercial Wi-Fi routers will have two bands on the radio. They'll have a 2.4 gigahertz mode and a 5 gigahertz mode. And for uh, home computing or home networking, oftentimes you'll want to use the 5 gigahertz mode because it's higher bandwidth. However, uh, you know, it's, what's funny about digital or, or about radio frequencies in the gigahertz band compared to audio frequencies is they behave the same way. The, the, the shorter the wavelength is, the more sensitive it is to geometry and edge diffraction and problems like that. So when you're using an iPad and you've set up your network to, to have your, your iPad be on the Wi-Fi, always use 2.4 gigahertz mode. It's got a longer range and it cares about obstructions less. And if you lose connectivity on your iPad, um, well, what's nice is you're probably not going to lose your actual audio feed, but you will, will lose your ability to control things. So that's no good. Yeah, when your iPad goes out, it doesn't affect the audio being passed through the console, but you can't control it. 
So right. if something's off, you can't turn it on. Right. So you, you want to be careful. Rick, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you were mentioning um loud guitar amps, mm. instrument amps, guitar amps in particular. And I was wondering if you did anything to mitigate that as far as positioning. Like, have you guys ever put the guitar amps on the sides or raise them up and put them behind the performer's head or put them in front of them so that they can get more sound to them and less sound to the house? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, something that I encourage bands to do, uh, which is going to go back to my point from long ago about being a salesman and getting them on your side, is, is once we have that rapport going, I'll suggest that bands set up their guitar amps as far to the sides as possible and um a lot of guitarists are used to using their loud guitar amp as a monitor during band practice which is often very very loud for them and some of them will get nervous about like if i tell them to turn their amp down uh they'll say well i can't hear myself without it and something that's that's another reason why i mentioned earlier as i did that i like to phrase it as a trade-off hey, if we can lose a little bit of guitar amp volume, I'll make sure to pass you more in your front monitors. And uh, in in response to your actual question about positioning, I've seen some engineers at venues do things like spinning the guitar amp around backwards and miking it from behind so that it's it's just a more isolated mic. And I don't use that technique here, but that's absolutely one way you can deal with it. If, you're, if your guitar amp is too loud and uh, the musician doesn't feel like turning it down or they're being obstinate about it, um, is you can, you can suggest repositioning the amp so that it's blasting the audience and, and yourself a little bit less. Or you can um, try to bargain with them and say, hey, I'll send you more on the monitors. Just anything you can do to keep the guitar amp from overwhelming the main PA mix. Because on your main PA mix, you're in control of it. But if the uh, guitarist amp itself is too loud, the only way to change that is to run up on stage and change their knob while they're playing, which is kind of, you know, off-putting for many people. And, uh, or you can just keep increasing the volume of your main mix to keep up with it, which is gonna start being painful or break your, your noise curfew or something like that. So yeah, do do what you can to get, if, if the guitar amp is like one of those really huge stacks, uh, get it pointed at the audience less or or make a deal to do anything to get them to turn it down. It's, it's, it's important to keep the mix sensible. Any other questions? Online folk? Comment on guitar amps. Hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm Steve Savannah from Ohio. One of the things that I've always done when a guitar player brings in an amp with uh, multiple speakers in it or a cabinet with potentially multiple speakers in it, I'll ask that guitar player which is the best speaker in his amp. Hmm. Oftentimes a guitar player will, will take out a speaker and put like a Celestian because he wants the tone. And in some cases I've seen a guy bring up a Marshall bottom with you know a, a, a four-stack bottom, and he'll have – three speakers taken out and just that celestion for tone and plywood stuck in the other openings. So I usually take a bright flashlight and shine it into the cabinet to make sure the speakers behind the, the holes in the, you know, the openings in the grill. And then I ask the guitar player, which is the best speaker in his amp, which has got the best tone. And that's usually where I'll put the microphone if I'm gonna, if I'm micing the guitar amp. So. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you on that. Uh, it's a, uh, Technique I use almost every time I'm micing up a guitar amp is I'll just grab my cell phone out of my pocket and put on the uh, put on the flashlight and hold it right up against the grill to see where the speakers are and it it's pretty easy to see if a speaker's missing. Occasionally, people use such dense grills that that doesn't work, but you can usually just peek around the back of the guitar amp. Usually, they're wide open and you can just see where the speaker is. Uh, another technique that I use for micing guitar amps is something that I picked up from more of a, a studio sort of setting where I'll tend to, uh, unless it's like rockabilly or something that's got a, a particular sound that's well-established, 
I'll tend to uh, mic rhythm guitars closer to the edge of the speaker so that I get a little bit brighter sound from it and lead guitars closer to the center of the speaker. Just all these all these tricks you can use to differentiate one guitar from the other. That also touches on uh, what I mentioned earlier about hard panning, similar sources, maybe not all the way hard, but more than you might when you're mixing a studio recording or mixing for headphones because in the room that extra separation isn't going to sound as extreme but it helps get the signals farther apart in in the mix so that there's less potential interference or just general muddiness does anybody another, have another another question from zoom land okay when you um uh, uh when you eq do you dig holes and fill them Oh, I am always uh, digging lots of holes out on the EQ. Sometimes I even take it a little bit too far and I have problems getting the fullness of the original sound. I would say that for mixing bands live at venues, it's more important to eliminate even the chance of feedback or like really gnarly zones in, in the, the frequency spectrum that are just overrepresented than it is to maybe necessarily have the most full or natural sounding mix. I, I would, when I'm mixing live bands, I would tend more towards the side of preventing problems rather than getting the most lush, perfect mix that I might take the time to like really get perfect if I was doing a, a mix down at home. Yeah, the digging holes and fill, filling them if I've got two instruments that are in the same frequency range, kick mm. drum and bass guitar is a good example, I'll find out what is more prominent for that band. They want a more prominent bass, bass guitar sound. So I'll carve a hole out on the kick drum and then put the bass guitar in that hole. And all of a sudden, I'm not adding up all of that low frequency energy in the room. And yeah, it's, we call it digging holes and filling them. And it can help smooth the mix out real quickly when. Uh, in, yeah, I, I see uh, what you're asking there. Um, another th another thing that I like to do on on things like bass drum and and uh, bass guitar that are kind of in the same range is um, usually I'll uh, again panning. I'll like pan the the bass drum slightly left, and I'll pan the bass guitar slightly right. Anything you can do to create more of a difference of the signal from one speaker to another will create a little more space for each of them. And one other thing that we do a lot is I like the idea that you start with the input gains on the console at kind of a lower level and kind of build. Oftentimes people will raise those input gains and all of a sudden they're clipping the input and all the overload lights come on. So what I'll do is I'll back those input gains down and if I need more level of that specific thing, mm -hmm. I'll use the compressor's makeup gain, which is further down the signal chain. And if I need to get more gain out, instead of raising the trim control, especially if you're sending that both to mains, front of house mains and monitors, if you would, if you've got your monitor level set and the, the band's happy with monitor levels, if you touch that trim control, once you've made that initial setting, you raise that trim control, for example, to bring something up louder in, in your mix. It also affects what's going to the monitors. So if I need to do that once I've got the basic mix built, I need more, more level out of a channel, I'm pushing the fader too high, I'll use the compressor limiter. Even if I'm not compressing, I'll use the makeup gain in that stage to, to add some additional gain into the into that channel if need be. And that's an excellent point. Um, that's why I made a special mention earlier when you're running your sound check that it's important to somewhat lowball your input gains because um, not only will people play more stridently during the actual show, it will save you from having to peel back input gain on a channel and then upsetting the, the balance of your monitor mix. Um, I'm about to wrap things up here. If there's any more questions, I'd be happy to take them now, or I can uh, just finish up soon. Anybody? Okay, go ahead. Well, final thoughts. Uh, I'll bet you thought I was going to say, remember to keep an eye on the clock, but I'd actually say that what's more important, the the, the single most important thing is keep your cool. 
uh, it can be very stressful. There's a there's a hard deadline on in terms of times, and sometimes the equipment that you find at venues is always just taking such a beating. Um, uh, cables fail, DI boxes fail, mics fail, stands are always like losing their grip. And it can just be maddening when one thing after another is just not working right. But people are going to come see the show. You've got to get it working one way or another. So keep cool. Don't don't make things any harder on yourself by stressing out. I'm going to keep cool while this slide takes forever to load. I'm just going to keep <laughs> pressing that button until we get everything. Oh, yeah. Don't be afraid to hop on stage. Uh, once the show's getting going, if like... The drummers really gotten into it and they've knocked a mic aside or may I, I i worked a show just last week where one of the guitarists felt like tackling the other guitarist it was awesome but it knocked a bunch of stuff all over the place i mean as long as you're not being a huge distraction don't worry about hopping up on stage and setting things right you know people in the crowd if you're if you're kind of shy like me uh it can be a little bit nerve-wracking to get into the habit but people in the crowd realize that you're just there keeping the machinery running and it's uh it's worth fixing rather than going the rest of the set with things not sounding quite right uh one thing that's not really part of the main part of my presentation but i felt like mentioning briefly is that oftentimes a headlining band will tour with their own front of house engineer and i remember when i was first getting my start in live music though i hate to admit it i always felt a little bit territorial when a guest engineer would come in i'd be like oh, i work hard to get the room sounding great and they're not going to do as good a job why why are they running the mix Eh, just let it go. The guest engineer for the headlining band, they need your help in order to make sure that things get plugged in in the right location or in order to find out where objects are kept or where test equipment lives. But ultimately, the guest engineer for the headlining band, they're running the show. You're there to help them. That's the way it is. Don't stress out about it. Just, just keep things running. Got it. One last bullet point to load, and we're home free. Any day now. Yeah. I'd just like to wrap up by reminding everybody that's working in live music that you're working in entertainment. You know, it's, it's, it's a job for you. It's not always fun. Sometimes it's tedious. Sometimes you really wish you were at home. Uh, but the band's there to play. The audience is there to see them. Both of them are there to have a good time. So get swept up in it. Have a good time yourself. Ultimately, you're doing a job that's really stimulating and entertaining, and uh, uh, it's worth remembering to enjoy it. I, I find that, as I mentioned, there's a negative stereotype about live sound engineers being grouchy, uh, and I just think there's no reason to be. This job is the best job in the world, and reminding yourself about it is is worth the mental effort. So. That about wraps things up. Uh, thanks for checking out my presentation. I sure I covered some pretty basic stuff for some people, but I hope that there was one or two things to learn. And for people that are just getting into live sound or just starting to learn about the X32 or M32 systems, I hope you picked up some practical tips to help make your live gig a success. Thanks, everybody. All right, nice job, Benjamin. Thank you. And thanks to everybody online and in person for attending. We appreciate you coming, and uh, we'll see you in the future. Go check out our next month's meeting. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everyone. This was awesome. See you next time. Thank you, Jess.